There are parallels. Both risks are well known to the insurance industry. Um, I co-authored a paper in 2007 with other chief risk officers of the insurance industry where we described what would happen if the 1918 flu happened again today. And if you read it today, it's eerie. A, a lot of predictions are correct. And the first sentence was actually, in the foreseeable future, we're going to see another pandemic. Um, so a lot was known. I think what was not known or not foreseen is the extreme reaction, the economic reaction of, of uh, all societies to that. So that there's a little surprise here. But this and climate change are both known. What, what maybe shocks me a little bit is you can see how uh, the enormous effort people put when the risk is imminent, like COVID-19. And another risk, which is as dangerous or maybe more dangerous, like climate change, because it happens over a long period of time, psychology probably dictates that people take it less seriously and, and, and wait way too long. So I agree on a philosophical level, there's similarities, but I really hope we can get the focus back on this huge problem, which is us changing our atmosphere. I think that's great you did that in 2007, Christian, and I will certainly go and look that up as soon as this show is finished. But my problem is the insurance industry wants people to be insured, of course, and against all kinds of risks. And I see these lists every year about the global risk, but people are left there thinking, well, what do I need to worry about the most? Is it climate? Is it pandemic? Is it cyber security? Which I think is number one for many CEOs as well. It's a bewildering choice as well. Does the industry have to turn around and say, no, these are the things that are clear and present dangers to the existence of mankind rather than these other risks, which are just peripheral by comparison? Yeah, no, I think what is really important is there is no zero risk society. That's impossible. I think the insurance industry acts as shock absorber for risks that you can diversify across the planet. So if there's a big natural catastrophe in America, there's other people in, uh, pay, paying the premium for that. And that's really our role. There are some mega risks that cannot be insured, like a huge meteorite dropping or a critical infrastructure being uh, wiped out or a global pandemic or a cyber pandemic, if you want. These are huge risks that cannot be diversified because they detach everybody at the same time. Uh, and that's where I think we need more mechanisms, more like uh, public-private mechanisms, as we have for terrorism, for example, where uh, insurance range industry works with the states to uh, create a system up front that is more effective in dealing with that. But you never get to uh, zero risk, and, and, and these mega risks are known. Uh, Christian, you mentioned that the insurance industry and reinsurance has fundamentally changed on the back of the pandemic. But we keep hearing different uh, rules and restrictions across various governments, uh, Europe, uh, about around travel corridors. And if you're in a red spot, uh, that uh, you have to have COVID tests and quarantine. Here in the UK, as to whether hotels could be used for quarantining uh, people on return from trips overseas, the costs keep on going up for travel. So how is the industry coping with the, the changes that keep on coming, uh, uh, given they're very ad hoc and last minute at this point? Well, I guess the industry has always tried to you know, look in the future and think about risks that could hit us, which is also why they cooperate with this global risk report, which we have seen. And then we need to try to think in advance how we can cope with them. And as I said, many risks that are diversifiable can be, can be taken by the insurance industry. But there will always be some extreme tail risk where the state will play a role, whether the state wants it or not. Because de facto, by not thinking about these risks, the state does post-financing. So once the catastrophe hit, enormous Enormous amounts of money are thrown in a, in a less than efficient way to the, to the whole industry. I mean, not the industry, but the whole uh, population. Whereas if you thought about it in advance, if there was a concentrated risk management effort by, by governments to think about all these risks in advance, you could devise schemes in advance uh, where you think about who should get it, how much should they get it, what's the distribution mechanism, when is it distributed, etc., which would make the use of funds much more effective. So in my view, one of the most important things is for, for, for governments to collaborate also with insurance companies to think about the risk landscape in advance and, and try to create schemes that, that you know, are more effective and create less pain than what we're experiencing right now. Uh, speaking of government collaboration, I want to come back to uh, this U.S. move to, to sign back up to the Paris Accord. Uh, we're early in the early days as to what that actually means for the United States in terms of actual targets in the countdown to 2030 first up. But what do you make of this first move by President Biden to be more climate friendly? Yeah, you see, 
to, to me, the, the exit from that Paris Accord was mostly symbolic because within the U.S., there's tons of forces at the state level, at the city level, at, at the you know, company level that just continued their plan and knew the seriousness of the situation and, and continued to uh, execute uh, and, and know we have a significant issue here. But symbols matters, and obviously uh, it's more than welcome to, to see the U.S. rejoin uh, all these countries who want to work on a, on a net zero all 2050, uh, and uh, we, we highly welcome that. Everybody highly welcomes that, and it's, a, it's an important uh, symbolic step also for all the countries or all the players or actors out there who do not want to go uh, on that path.